Welcome to Chapter 22, Book Problems. Make sure you have a paper, pencil, calculator. There will be very few uh, calculations to do, but if there are, make sure that you can prove each one. This chapter is essentially on heat transfer, convection, conduction, and radiation. Uh, there will be several... Uh, several pictures that will explain the situation, several activities at the end of this PowerPoint that we will do in class and I will film. Good luck. Let's look at the first one. What is the role of loose electrons in conductors? They transfer energy from the conducting material. If something is a a good electrical conductor, for instance, a very good electrical conductor would be copper. An even better electrical conductor, probably the best, would be silver. And if something is a good electrical conductor or conducts electricity at all, will also conduct heat. Something such as rubber or paper or wood that does not conduct electricity or air it would be a poor conductor of heat. Why, why does a piece of room temperature metal feel colder to the touch than paper, wood, or cloth? Well, because it can conduct. The better the conductor, the more it will feel cold. Remember, cold is, is energy leaving your hand. Your hand is higher concentration than the than what it's touching. So the energy will flow from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So your hand will feel cold because energy is passing out of your hand. <clears throat> so if you touch two surfaces in the same room that have achieved thermal equilibrium, then when one feels cold and one feels neither hot nor cold, such as a piece of wood, think of touching a piece of uh, pine, it's not going to feel either hot or cold. It'll feel pretty normal. But a piece of metal will feel cold. You may ask, you may think that the cold, that the wood, that, I'm sorry, that the metal is colder, but it's not. It just can conduct energy away from your hand better. So it feels colder because that's what's happening in your hand. Remember, cold is a process by which energy leaves your hand. Hot and cold are relative. It's up to you to make the decision based on what you feel. But by and large, the metal and the wood are at the same temperature and one will conduct energy out of your hand and feel colder. A perfect example of that is is standing on a a floor. You've maybe gotten out of the shower and you, you, it's a tile floor and it will feel very cold, but you put uh, a, a, shower, a shower sheet on the floor and it doesn't feel so cold because the rug, the cotton, the, tw the, uh, the fabric material will not conduct uh, heat where the, where, the, where the stone floor will conduct heat. Remember, the ground will conduct heat. Uh, the ground will conduct electrical charge. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Why are materials such as wood, fur, feathers, and even snow good conductors or good insulators? <clears throat> they have many air spaces and air is a good insulator. When something is a poor conductor, it's generally because it has no air in it. Uh, air is the culprit. It's air, it does not conduct heat. It doesn't conduct electricity. Uh, well, it certainly can conduct electri electricity, you see, with a lightning storm. But by and large, it's the air that's in these articles that make it, uh, that make them, uh, resistance to heat transfer. What is meant by saying that cold is not a tangible thing? Well, hot and cold are simply, are very tangible. I disagree with that. Uh, cold is the absence of heat. 
I don't buy that either. Cold is a flow of energy out of your hand. Uh, <clears throat> cold is a very individual thing to the individual person. Uh, warm is something, something feels warm or hot. It's energy is passing into your hand. How does Archimedes principle relate to convection? Well, it has to do with changes in density and warmed, warmed air is less dense and is buoyed up buoyed upward. So it has to do with changes in density. Anything that has differences in densities or differences in pressure, such as a submerged object, is going to be related to Archimedes' principle. Why does the direction of coastal winds change from night and day? Because <clears throat> the land is warmer than the water during the day, so the air rises. The opposite happens at night. So pretty, I think I went over this uh, in the in the in yesterday's or chapter 21 problems or maybe even the lecture uh, how does the temperature of a gas change when it is compressed when it expands it increases when it's compressed decreases when it expands if adiabatic dominoes are placed upright in a row one next to another when one is tipped over, it knocks against its neighbor, which does the same in a cascade fashion until a whole row collapses. Which of the three types of heat transfer is this most similar to? Uh, conduction, because conduction is when one thing touches. So you think of touching when you think of conduction for obvious reasons. What is radiant energy? Radiant energy is simply, solely, specifically, and only electromagnetic radiation. The sun heats the earth through electromagnetic radiation, uh, light, infrared. Uh, so it's, it's, it's light from the sun that ultraviolet light, visible light, these are the things that, uh, that are radiation. How does, the, how does the predominant frequency of radiant energy vary with the absolute temperature of the radiating source? Higher temperatures produce, sources produce waves of higher frequencies. Higher frequencies such as gamma is the highest frequency, radio waves is the lowest frequency. So the higher the temperature, the, the shorter the wavelength, the, uh, the, uh, the higher the frequency. Well, that's a little confusing. I'll maybe go back to that a little bit. Ask me about that in class. Is a good absorber of radiation a good emitter or a poor emitter? Well, <clears throat> this is the rule. Good absorber, good emitter. Poor absorber, poor emitter. So it would be good, otherwise there would be no thermal equilibrium. Which, which will normally cool faster? Black pot of hot tea or a silvered pot of hot tea. Black is a better emitter, so it will cool faster. Uh, silver is a good reflector, good reflector, uh, poor emitter. Bad reflector, uh, good emitter. Uh, why does a good absorber of radiant energy appear black? Because light is entering and it's not being reflected back lights being absorbed like a black hole will absorb light uh, your your pupil of your eye light is going in it's not coming out so it sees we see black something has a color only because it is reflecting that particular light wave if it's uh, if it appears white then it's reflecting all light uh, so it depends upon what's being reflected if no lights being reflected it appears black. If only green lights being reflected, it appears green. If uh, so, white, it's either white, uh, Roy G. Biv, or black. Next. Which will undergo the greater rate of cooling? A red hot poker in a warm oven or a red hot poker in a cold room? Or do both cool at the same rate? Uh, Newton's law of cooling simply says that the rate of cooling is proportional to the 
the the amount of temperature change that will occur. So it will be uh, a cold room because of greater delta T. Does Newton's law of cooling apply to warming as well as cooling? It absolutely, positively, 100% does. Solar radiant energy is composed of short waves, yet terrestrial radiation is composed of relatively longer waves. Why? Uh, Earth's temperature is lower, so it produces waves of longer uh, length. That's a little confusing. Solar radiant energy is composed of short waves, yet terrestrial radiation. Well, that's just heat. Heat is, uh, it's giving off heat. The Earth is giving off heat, so it's going to be infrared. Uh, the sun is giving off light, so that's going to be visible. So just look at the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. Uh, red, uh, infrared heat is long waves and visible or shorter. Uh, so it's relative. It's infrared is relative to uh, is relative to um, uh, visible in terms of wavelength. Kind of an easy question, actually. Twenty uh, A. What does it mean to say that the greenhouse effect? is like a one-way valve, uh, kind of like Hotel California. You know, you can check at any time, but you can't leave. The, uh, the, the visible light comes in, uh, and, which has short waves, and the infrared has longer waves, and it can't get out. So the, the atmosphere is, is transparent to short waves and, uh, and, uh, uh, and not transparent to long waves. Is the greenhouse effect more pronounced for florists, greenhouses, or Earth's atmospheres? Well, uh, uh, it would be Earth uh, because it's just bigger. Um, uh, and glass is a little bit different from the Earth's atmosphere. Kind of a weird question. Uh, don't mean to give too much of a commentary here. At what common temperature will both a block of wood and a piece of metal feel neither hot nor cool when you touch them with your hand? Uh, same temperature, when they're the same temperature as your hand. Uh, if you stick a metal rod in a snowbank, the end of your hand will soon become cold. Does this cold flow from the snow of your hand? It, it, it flows from your hand uh, because it feels cold. Cold is energy leaving your hand. So it flows into the metal rod. Kind of weird that people don't really get uh, hot and cold. Kind of a silly question. If you understand that cold is a feeling an individual feels when uh, energy is leaving their hand. Some people have perennially cold hands uh, and they always feel cold because energy is always passing out of their hands. It's not absorbing. It's not, you know, energy is not going into their hands enough. So it always feels cold. Uh, wood is a better insulator than glass, yet fiberglass is commonly used as an insulator in wood buildings because it traps the air. The, the, the better, it, glass doesn't trap air. Uh, fiberglass is kind of like a, a bunch of straw made out of glass and that's simply gonna trap the air. So the better it traps air, uh, the better it is going to be as an insulator. And fiberglass will trap air. Wool will trap air. Down will trap air. Feathers will trap air. Down and feathers are actually very different. The down is the, is the stuff underneath the feathers. So anything that traps air, your blanket, wool. Uh, why is wool better than cotton? Well, because cotton will lose its integrity. It will kind of flatten out and and it won't won't hold as much air. So wool maintains its 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 size. So wool is actually a better insulator than cotton. Uh, so always important to wear a combination of cotton and woolen socks. Uh, <clears throat> visit a snow-covered cemetery and note that the snow does not slope upward against the gravestone, but instead forms a depression around them as shown. Uh, 
make a hypothesis explaining why this is true. Because the ground will absorb, will conduct heat. The ground conducts heat. So the heat from the warm ground is conducted uh, by the stone and melts the snow in contact. So the reason this happens is the ground is a good conductor. Again, it will also conduct electricity. That's why lightning occurs. Uh, more about that in another chapter. Wood is a poor conductor, which means that heat is slow to transfer even when wood is very hot. Why can fire walkers safely walk barefoot on red hot wooden coals, but not safely walk barefoot on red hot pieces of iron? Two reasons. Uh, wood is a terrible conductor, and you take one look at that wooden pit and you're going to be a nervous wreck and you're going to sweat bullets. So your feet are going to sweat. Uh, water is a poor conductor. Uh, wood, wood is a poor conductor. Water is a poor conductor. So um, between those two things and the fact that iron is a very good conductor, the iron transfer internal energy very fast. Um, right. When a space shuttle is in orbit and there appears to be no gravity in the cabin, why can a handle, not a candle, not stay lit? Uh, very interesting, but uh, the reason is because there's no convection. The CO2 around the candle cuts off the oxygen oxygen supply, so a candle burns if you think about it. Now let me demonstrate that in class. But a candle burns because of convection. A candle burns because of convection. And there's no convection if there's in, in uh, the space station. A friend says that in a mixture of gases in thermal equilibrium, the molecules have the same average kinetic energy. Do you agree or do you disagree? You agree at thermal equilibrium, gases have same temperature, which means same average kinetic energy. Uh, gases uh, all behave generally the same. There are exceptions, but at STP, at NTP, gases all behave pretty much the same physically. Chemically, obviously, they're going to act react differently. Oxygen's going to react differently than chlorine chemically. But physically, at, at standard temperature, room temperature, uh, zero degrees, which is standard temperature. Standard temperature and pressure is one atmosphere and zero degrees Celsius. NTP, normal temperature and pressure, is 20 degrees and one atmosphere. Might be 25 degrees and one atmosphere. Either way, uh, at, that, at that way, they all act the same. Uh, so uh, a friend says that in a mixture of gases, I think I did that. Yeah, a mixture of gases thermically the molecules have the same average speed. Do you agree or disagree? You disagree. Having same kinetic energy doesn't mean same speed unless all molecules have equal masses. So that's a little bit different. That's pretty good actually. Uh, so 28 is kind of cool. A uh, friend says in a mixture of gases in thermal equilibrium the molecules have the same average speed. Yeah, uh, that's great. If you look up Graham's law uh, that will help you with that. In a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, gases at the same temperature, which molecules move faster and why? Well, the idea is this. Uh, for instance, they say in the answer, hydrogen molecules are faster. Ke equals one half mv squared. For fixed Ke, less mass means greater speed. So there it is. Uh, pretty simple. If it's same kinetic energy, you know, if, if you have a if you have a bug and a car uh, with the with the same energy, uh, the bug is going to be moving extremely fast, like kind of bizarrely fast. Uh, which atoms have the greater average speed? In a mixture, U U238, which is not very visible, um, and in U235, how would this affect diffusion through a porous membrane or otherwise identical gases made?
from these isotopes. Uh, less mass means higher speed, so the U-235 has a greater average speed, lighter and slightly faster. U-235 diffused better. Uh, that's actually how they separated U-238, which is not, doesn't work very good in an atomic bomb. U-235 is the good one, and that's how they basically separated U-238 from U-235. A very costly uh, and painstaking way to uh, uh, make an atom bomb. Uh, notice that a desk lamp often has small holes near the top of the metal shade. How do these holes keep the lamp cool? They allow convection. So the, the, the incandescent bulb, which is really hot, it's a great, great heat source, a terrible light source in terms of efficiency. It gets hot and it just goes right out the back. It doesn't shine uh, on your paper and uh, trap the heat and it would ultimately cause a fire if it got if it got too hot. A bulb gets very hot, very hot, and paper burns at 451 Fahrenheit. Turn an incandescent lamp on and off quickly while you are standing near it. You feel its heat, but you find when you touch the bulb that it is not hot. Explain why you felt heat from the lamp. Heat received is from radiation. Eh, that's actually a pretty cool example. That's a, that's a way of, of uh, explaining radiation. Uh, if you're in a fireplace and you're far away from the fireplace but you feel the heat, uh, that's infrared radiation that you're feeling. That's not, uh, that's not uh, conduction. In Montana, the state highway department spreads coal dust on the top of snow when the sun comes out. The snow rapidly melts. Why? Seems like an awfully polluting way of doing things, but the dust is black and absorbs solar energy, and then the snow melts. Uh, kind of interesting. Never knew that. But again, it seems very polluting, uh, kind of as a rule. Uh, so if you're ever out in Montana, uh, send me a picture of the uh, the roads covered with black coal dust. Uh, I'll give you some retroactive extra credit. Why doesn't uh, let's do some extra credit on that? Uh, Twitter me something interesting about that. Uh, maybe a picture or something. I'll give you some extra credit. Suppose that a person at a restaurant is served coffee before he or she is ready to drink it in order that the coffee be hottest when the person is ready for it. Should cream be added to it right away or just before you drink it? Right away, because white coffee won't radiate so quickly. Uh, also, the higher the temperature of the coffee compared to its surroundings, the greater will be the rate of the cooling also, uh, and increasing the amount of liquid for, for the same surface area slows the cooling. That's pretty cool. Will a can of beverage cool just as fast in the regular part of the refrigerator as it will in the freezer compartment? What physical law do you think about before answering this? No, it cools faster in the freezer because its rate of cooling is proportional to the difference in temperature. Excellent. I would take this slide and I would put it on pause and I would put it back and re and look at this again. This is a really good one, uh, really good one. So there's three reasons why you would put cream in coffee uh, to, to reduce the difference to, because of Newton's laws of cooling, volume, and white is a poor emitter of energy. Excellent, May, very interesting. Is it important to convert temperatures to the Kelvin scale when we use Newton's law of cooling? Why or why not? Not important. Either, gi uh, either gives the same difference because one degree Kelvin, or sorry, one Kelvin, they're not degrees, one Kelvin equals one degree Celsius. If you wish to save fuel on a cold day and you're going to leave your warm house for a half hour or so, should you turn your thermostat down a few degrees down all the way or leave it at room temperature? Very interesting question. 
uh, if, you're, if you wish to save fuel on a cold day, you're going to leave your warm house for a half an hour or so. So should you turn your thermostat down a few degrees, down all the way, or leave it at room temperature? All fall together. The amount of heat energy and thus fuel required to raise the temperature inside again is small compared with the amount of heat energy that continually escapes. Oh, excellent question. So it's important to turn your heat down, and that's what I do all the time. My heat is down, way down, very low. When I come home, it's kind of cold. So you turn it off altogether, and this saves uh, a lot of a lot of heat. And it's all, and you know, it's good that heat can escape because the bad gases are escaping. You know, you should have some kind of ventilation in your house. So you don't get buildup of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. So, you know, a perfectly, a perfectly insulated house may not be a good thing. Why is whitewash sometimes applied to a glass of florists' greenhouses? Would you expect this practice to be more prevalent in winter or summer months? Whitewash reduces incoming radiation, radiant energy by reflection of so good in the summer. And what they do is they put kind of... Um, kind of like glass wax, the old style glass wax that comes in, it spreads on white, then you wipe it off, you know, after it dry, you let it dry, then you wipe it off. So what they do is they put on this glass wax, then they leave it there all summer. And then in the winter, they, they wipe it off. It's kind of cool. So they're not really whitewashing, they're putting on glass wax and then leaving it on all, all summer. If the composition of the upper atmosphere were changed so that it permitted a greater amount of terrestrial radiation to escape, what effect would this have on Earth's climate? Conversely, what would be the effect in the upper atmosphere reduced? What would be the effect if the upper atmosphere reduced the, the escape of terrestrial radiation? Excellent question. Earth's temperature would decrease and cooling of the climate would result. Conversely, warming of the Earth's climate would result. Uh, Earth's temperature would decrease and cooling of the climate would result. Conversely, warming of the Earth's climate would result. Very interesting. Uh, you may want to put this on autopilot uh, so, uh, and read, and read it again. Excellent question. If the composition of the upper atmosphere were changed so that it permitted a greater amount of terrestrial radiation to escape, because why would that happen? Because that's, uh, uh, that's just simply, you know, convection, you know, uh, so everything's, every, the heat's rising and so it would cool off. Uh, and what would it, if you, if you restricted it, it would warm up. So think of, when you think of terrestrial radiation, think of uh, convection, because terrestrial radiation is generally infrared radiation. An automobile cooling system holds 12 liters of water. Show that when its temperature rises from 20 degrees Celsius, to 70 degrees Celsius, it absorbs 60 kilocalories. Well, one liter is one kilogram, so 12 liters is 12 kilograms. 12 kilograms is 12,000 grams. Q equals MC delta T. Q equals 12,000 grams times one calorie per gram degree Celsius times 50 degrees, which is the difference, and that's six uh, 60,000 uh, calories. So it's um, a lot of calories. Uh, so it, it uh, 60 kilocalories would be uh, 60,000, uh, 60 kilocalories. So that's going to be 600 kilocalories it will absorb. Um, so I'm actually not showing that. Uh, so it'd be six, 600,000 calories. I will go back and check that. 
uh, let me see what happens with that. But if you don't hear from me, then it's kind of weird. But it uh, it doesn't it it does sixty six hundred kilocalories. Austin places a fifty gram aluminum ball into an insulated cup containing seventy five grams of water at twenty degrees Celsius. The ball and the water reach an equilibrium temperature at of thirty seven degrees Celsius. Austin makes some calculations and reports that the initial temperature of the ball must have been slightly more than 155 degrees Celsius. Do your calculations agree? Yes. Uh, loss by ball equals gain by water. And so the loss by ball would be 50 grams times the specific heat capacity of the ball times 37 degrees is the final temperature minus the initial temperature and uh, uh, so uh, that's going to equal the the gain by the water which is going to be negative the quantity uh, 75 grams times 1 times 17 and ti is going to figure out to be 155 okay I'm going to take a break. Good time for you to take a break. Uh, I'll be back. And hey, you won't even realize I'm gone. Isn't that weird? Uh, kind of like uh, time is not real. Time is fluid. Okay, uh, I'll be right back. I'm going to take a break and I'm going to check out that problem as well and be right back. Okay, welcome back. Decay of radioactive isotopes of thorium and uranium in granite and other rocks in the Earth's interior provide sufficient energy to keep the interior molten heat lava and provide warmth to natural hot springs. This is due to the average release of about 0 0.03 joules per kilogram each year. Show that 13.3 million years are required for a chunk of thermally insulated granite to increase 500 degrees Celsius in temperature. Use 800 joules per gram degree Celsius for the specific heat capacity of granite. <coughs> um, okay, let's do it. Uh, Q uh, equals MC delta H, and you're looking for the ratio of uh, Q over M. So that's going to equal 400,000 uh, joules per kilogram. So uh, show that 13 million years are required for a chunk of thermally insulated granite to increase 500 degrees in temperature. Okay, so the next slide will will continue this and it will be um, okay so 400,000 joules per kilogram over 0 0.03 joules per kilogram year so let's look at this again decree decay of radioactive isotopes of thorium and uranium in granite and other rocks in earth's interior provide sufficient energy to keep the interior molten heat lava and provide warmth to natural hot springs. This is due to the average release of about 0 0.03 joules per kilogram each year. Show that 13.3 million years are required for a chunk of thermally insulated granite <coughs> to increase 500 degrees in in temperature. Use 800 joules per gram degree Celsius for the specific heat uh, capacity of granite. And the time required is 400,000 joules per kilogram divided by uh, 0.03 joules per kilogram year and that's 13,300,000. So it's perfect. It's exactly the way it is. Excellent question. And years are left over. I know what you're saying. You're going to have a little bit of a problem with the unit labels. And so I'll do this problem again in class. Remind me. 
and I'll do this problem. Extra credit to whomever reminds me in class, who is ever the first one to remind me to do this problem in class. This is a, a, an experiment you may have done in chemistry last year. I believe I smelled uh, peanut, uh, peanuts burning. In a lab, you burn 0 0.06 grams of peanuts, uh, <clears throat> probably just a couple of peanuts at the most, uh, beneath 50 grams of water. Heat from the peanut increases the temperature of the water uh, <clears throat> from 22 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius, assuming 40% efficiency. I'm not quite sure it's even going to be that much. Show that the food value of the peanut is 3,500 calories or 3.5 dietary calories. Okay, so at the bottom you see the heat Q is going to be 50 grams. That's the peanuts. 50 grams is the water, sorry. One calorie per gram degree Celsius times 50 minus 22. So that's going to be, what, um, 28, and that's going to be 1,400 calories. So that's the first part. Uh, so <clears throat> it's going to produce 1,400 calories. So now, now let's say, let's say that that represents a value that is 40% uh, 40 efficient. So how does 1,400, uh, 3,500, and 40% efficient uh, work into this? Well, let's look at the next slide. Uh, let's read the problem again. In a lab, you burn a 0.6 gram peanut uh, beneath 50 grams of water. Heat from the peanut increases the water temperature from 22 to 35, from 22 to 50. Assuming 40% efficiency, show that the food value of the peanut is 3.5 dietary calories. It's 40, so we, we produce 1,400 calories from that experiment. And if that's 40% efficient, you say 40% of what value uh, equals 1,400 calories. So that food value peanut is, is going to be, it's going to be 0.4 of, of of whatever that is. We're assuming it's going to be uh, 3,500 calories. So then solve for food value and that's going to be 1,400 divided by 0.4 and that's going to be 3,500. So that's that's perfect. Uh, what is the food value in calories per gram? 5.8 calories. And if you think about it, that's a, that's, you know, people sit and eat bags of peanuts and peanut butter, yet they are very caloric, uh, extremely caloric. So just one peanut is 5.8 calories per gram, and the body is much more is going to be much more efficient in burning that fuel than uh, this lab was. So, so 3.5 calories or 5.8 calories per per gram is going to be serious. Uh, if I get a minute later, I will tell you uh, how many peanuts are generally in a peanut butter sandwich. Probably a lot. Pounding a nail into wood makes the nail warmer. Suppose a hammer exerts an average force of 500 newtons on a 6 centimeter nail whose mass is 5 grams when it drives into the piece of wood. Work is done on the nail and it becomes hotter. If all the heat goes, in, goes to the nail, show that its increase in temperature is slightly more than 13 degrees Celsius. Use four, 450 joules per kilogram degree Celsius for the specific heat capacity of the nail. That's actually the specific heat capacity of, the, of iron. So the delta T for the nail from Q equals, from Q equals MC delta T. Five kilograms is 0 0.005 five grams is 0 0.005 kilograms, six centimeters is 0 0.06 meters, FD equals 30 joules. All right, now, so it's 30 joules of work, 500 newtons, and it's 0 0.06 meters. So that's a very important starting point. 
Now the next slide will uh, finish the problem. So just the work done by the hammer is 30, 30 joules. So 30 joules is the amount of energy, okay? And that's going to equal the mass of the nail times the specific heat capacity of the nail and then times the change in temperature delta T. And so solving for delta T, you get, you get 13.3 degrees Celsius. So <clears throat> let's look and see what we did here. We changed 5 grams to 0 0.005 kilograms. We changed 6 centimeters to 0 0.06 meters. So um, we applied 500 newtons on the nail and uh, work is done on the nail and it becomes hotter if all the heat goes into the nail. Show that its increase in temperature is slightly more than 13 degrees Celsius. Okay, so <clears throat> 500 newtons times 6 centimeters or times 0 0.06 centimeters is going to be 30 joules. So that, and that, all that work, the 30 joules is going into the nail. Boom. And the nail is 5 kilograms, 5, 0 0.005 kilograms. 450 is the specific capacity of iron or the nail and then delta T. Solving through for delta T, 13.3. Um, and how would you, you know, would the, would all the heat stay in the nail or how would that work? The answer would be no because it's going to conduct heat out of it. But it's in the wood and the wood is not going to conduct heat. So it's an interesting question about whether or not it, how hot it stays. At a certain location, the solar power per unit area reaching Earth's surface is 200 watts per meter squared averaged over a 24-hour day. Consider a house with an average power requirement of 3 kilowatts, that's 3,000 watts, with solar panels on the roof that convert solar power to electrical power with 25% efficiency. Show that a solar collector area of 60 square meters will meet the 3 kilowatt requirement. So at 25% efficiency, each square meter of collector supplies 50 watts of average on average. So 3,000 3, watts, 3 kilowatts, divided by 50 watts per square meter um, because of the efficiency is down. It says it's a quarter efficient, so a quarter of 200 is 50, and that's going to be 60 square meters of collector area. So uh, that's going to work. That's going to work actually very well. By the way, uh, I did, I, I checked on that uh, 60 uh, kilocalories, that problem that we did. Uh, the problem is actually you know, they ask for 60 kilowatts and then you calculated 600 kilowatts or 600,000 calories. Well, the, the book was wrong. 600,000 is correct, uh, but they're asking for 60 kilowatts. They're probably saying 600 kilowatts, uh, sorry, kilocalories. They're probably asked for 60 kilocalories, uh, 600 kilocalories. They ask for 60 kilocalories. So, but the problem that we did, the way we did it, the way the information was given to us was correct. Now we're going to do some activities. These are just a few things, uh, you know, don't try these on your own. You don't want to start a fire. We'll do these in class. Anybody wants to come after school and uh, help me set these up and try them first. Uh, <clears throat> we'll, I'll give you extra credit. Hold the bottom end of a test tube full of cold water in your hand. Heat the top part of the flame until the water boils. The fact that you can still hold the bottom shows that water is a poor conductor of heat. This is even more dramatic when you wedge chunks of, of ice at the bottom. When the, when the water above can be brought to a boil without melting the ice. Try it and see. This is a good demo to show. 
Steel wool can be used to wedge the ice at the bottom of the test tube. Be sure to put the top part of the water-filled tube in the flame. Yeah, don't put the bottom part because it'll just go boom and everything will go flying out of it. Uh, so let's do that in class. Somebody can remind me and, uh, and we'll practice that. I think they did that on the film that we saw. Um, but it's certainly better to do it in our own class, and I'll film that. Uh, so, uh, extra credit for whoever comes after school, let's say Monday after school, Monday or Tuesday after school, and we'll work on that. Okay, so next. It says... If you live where there is snow, do as Benjamin Franklin did more than two centuries ago and lay out samples of light and dark clothes on the snow. If you don't live in a snowy area, try, uh, try this using ice cubes. Describe differences in the rate of melting under the clothes. The snow under the dark clothes melts faster the dark cloth absorbs more energy from the sun. Uh, something very interesting in my in my uh, my backyard, actually my side yard. I have a fence there, and it has southern exposure. And in the winter, when it's like oh, 25 degrees outside, I can sit out on my on my uh, on my uh, uh, on a chair on my porch. Uh, and it's pretty warm because the house is all very light colored, uh, very light colored uh, siding and it reflects all the light's ray and it just warms the air so wonderfully and uh, it's, it's excellent. The house doesn't get hot, but it will reflect the, the, uh, the sunlight back uh, right into me. So it's kind of cool. Uh, and if you, if you did four things, if you did four things, you would be... You know, if everybody did four things, if every homeowner in the world did four things, we would have no energy problems. This is a Darcy thing. Uh, paint your house white, paint your roof white, have, uh, have uh, all your windows redone, and insulate your attic, with, including with ventilation. Uh, those four things, that's all you need to do. And you would, you would reduce the amount of energy that, you, that we use uh, remarkably. It would be absolute no-brainer. This is kind of a cool experiment. Uh, we'll actually do this uh, again Monday after school. We'll do this. So plan on staying if you want extra credit. And we'll actually film this. And we'll take a piece of toilet paper. We have plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, uh, cylinders of... Of, uh, of of metal, and we will heat the heat the uh, heat the uh, toilet paper, and see what happens. The metal must reach 230 degrees Celsius for the paper to do the same. So, you know, what is that temperature relative to 451? Uh, 451 degrees Fahrenheit. So. We know that 451 is the temperature in which paper is ignited. That's the name of that book, 451 Fahrenheit, where they burned all the books. So do that quick calculation. Do, you know, put in, you know, uh, nine-fifths times 230 plus 32. Eh, it's pretty going to be pretty close to 451. I think 451 would actually, uh, it's going to be pretty close. 451... Uh, would equal approximately 230. Okay, it's, it's been fun. Uh, have a great day. And um, I'm going to put on another video. And this one's going to be, you, I'm just going to put on a picture of something. And I'm going to narrate the picture. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, my, my test and quiz and just look through it and talk. Talk to the audience. And that's all I'm going to do. No slideshow, just my voice. My wonderfully soothing voice. Have a great day. I hope you're enjoying your vacation.
have a good day and goodbye.